I'm a woman who cheated on her deployed husband, and this is why I did it. Like most military couples, we married way too young, caught up in the whirlwind of romance and duty. I was 19, he was 21. If we'd been older, wiser, maybe we could have prevented the implosion of our marriage. It started out like a fairy tale. We met at a dive bar near base, and there was an instant cosmic connection. Within months, we were inseparable. So when Lucas got orders to relocate across the country, I didn't hesitate. I dropped out of community college and followed him to North Carolina as his adoring fiancé. Two months after arriving, we stood before a justice of the peace and exchanged vows. No fancy church, no bridesmaids, just the two of us and the court clerk as our witness, the way it was for so many military brides. I tried to convince myself the bare-bones ceremony didn't matter. Love would conquer all, right? How naive I was. The cracks started showing before we even left on our honeymoon. Lucas's single-minded focus on his career left me feeling like an afterthought. While I took a job waitressing to pay the bills, he spent long hours drilling with his unit, obsessing over physical training, watching war films. Our apartment became his barracks. Everything was spit-polished perfection while I just tried to cope with the loneliness. When we were intimate, he seemed to be making love to the military, not me. Holding me afterwards, he'd murmur about the honor of serving, the sacrifices we'd all have to make. I'd lie awake at night wondering if I'd ever really know the man I married. The first deployment came too soon, a six-month tour to Afghanistan just nine months after our wedding. I sobbed for every night leading up to his departure. But Lucas remained stoic, his jaw set in that military hardness I'd come to know too well. As I watched him grab his duffel and march towards the transport, I wondered if he'd even miss me. Those six months were the loneliest of my life. I wrote him weekly letters, consistently upbeat, never mentioning how much I struggled with the isolation and the rampant loneliness. His letters in return were infrequent and clipped, military jargon about operations and Humvees, never a word about missing my face or my embrace. So when Christo started chatting me up at the diner, I was instantly drawn to his Indeezy charisma. For the first time in years, I felt seen, heard, desired. He asked about my hopes and dreams in a way Lucas never did. With Christo, I got to escape the constant anxiety over deployments, loneliness, and that damn war. We started meeting up after my shifts, and before long, we were in a full-blown affair. I knew it was wrong, but Christ gave me an aliveness I'd been so desperately lacking. He inspired a sense of self-worth and passion that had worn away in my military marriage. When Lucas eventually returned home, I fell back into that same numb cycle, supporting his unwavering march towards career while inwardly withering. After his homecoming, the fire Christo ignited in me couldn't be extinguished. The disconnect between Lucas and me was more apparent than ever. That's when I realized I had to choose, the military wife institution, or my personal redemption. As agonizing as it was, I chose myself and the chance to feel sparklingly alive again with Christo. We made plans to leave this world of camo and Kevlar behind forever. I know in the eyes of the military community, I'm the worst kind of villain. A faithless wife who dishonored her husband while he defended our country. But unless you've experienced that particular flavor of invisibility and alienation you can't understand, Lucas is a great man, brave, dedicated, honorable. But in his single-minded pursuit of soldiering, he slowly drained me of my identity. I became little more than a staffing requirement. The box checked for having a wife, just like having all his gear prepped and pressed. Over those first few years of marriage, I contorted myself into a poorly fitting role. I smiled and cheered him on as he achieved each new military milestone, all while a piece of me withered. Who was I, aside from Lucas's wife? An individual with hopes, dreams, passions of her own? Or just a background character dutifully propping up his shining lead role? When he deployed that first time, the isolation cemented my invisibility. My daily sacrifices of managing our household, paying bills, and simply surviving without my partner went completely unremarked upon. 
In Lucas's mind, and that of the entire base community, his septic tank inspection in the Hindu Kush was the only arduous journey worth acknowledging. I'm not discounting the very real hardship and danger he faced overseas, but my people constantly glorified his role to the point that my sacrifices were rendered invisible and meaningless. In their eyes, I was just wife, a flat secondary character with no inner existence of her own. So yes, when Christo came along and breathed life into my faded sense of self, I was enormously susceptible. Here was a man who savored my perspective, my stories, my dreams, who saw me as more than just appendage wife. He revived a spark inside me that had been subsumed for too long beneath the machinery of the military-industrial complex. With Christo, I was the leading lady again. My own desires, hopes, and passions placed center stage instead of perpetually overshadowed. For the first time in years, I remembered what it felt like to be truly seen and cherished as a fully-fledged human being. Was the affair ethical? Of course not. I'll carry that substantial moral failure for the rest of my days. But when your identity has been systematically erased, you'll do just about anything to become visible again, even to yourself. Lucas was a casualty of that desperation, caught in the blast radius of my furious personal reclamation. As I looked into the depths of Christo's adoring eyes, I could no longer ignore the truth. I had to choose between shedding my military wife costume forever or merely existing as Lucas's negative space appendage until I turned to dust. I didn't make the choice lightly, but I've never looked back. Christo and I packed up and relocated to the West Coast, far from the wife-worshipping military towns. Out here, I'm not Brian's wife or Sergeant Johnson's spousal commitment. I'm simply me, a person of authenticity and zest who doesn't have to dim her light. Lucas and I had some turbulent emotional discussions as I disengaged from that life. He'll never understand the erasure of selfhood I experienced, being a man sworn to the sisterhood of arms. All he sees is a cheating wife who destroyed her patriotic obligation. But I see it as the act of a drowning woman, gasping for an oxygen supply that had been cut off for far too long. You can judge me, but until you've had your identity systematically obliterated by a powerful institution, you simply can't comprehend. So this is my life now. A tiny apartment, a serving job, and the twinned sensations of sweet hardship and a revival of authenticity. When I look at Christo, I see my unconventional savior the man who reminded me that I anted to truly live before it was too late. I burned that old identity to the ground. But like the phoenix rising, I've been reborn from the ashes into someone who burns a little brighter.